So when we're studying bacterial cells, uh, we have to look at the cell membrane. Uh, and this is sort of right from the, the very start in structuring the cell. So we could look at it you know, from the inside or from the outside, but uh, the environment inside the cell where all the chemical activities take place is gonna be the cytoplasm. cytoplasm and that's going to be here now typically the area outside the cell we were we would refer to as the extracellular environment and there would just be the cytoplasmic environment inside the cell the extracellular environment outside the cell and then the cell membrane now, for eukaryotic cells, that's generally true. Then the cytoplasm is broken up into compartments and spaces with more membranes. But bacteria do not have inner membranes. So their cell membrane is the outer membrane. And it's the only membrane they have, uh, also referred to as the plasma membrane. So you might see it written uh, with different terms referring to it. Some of these terms are completely interchangeable. Some of the terms refer to certain slightly different specific structures. So that's what I'm gonna to try to clarify uh, here in this short little lecture and orientation. So uh, a cell membrane itself, and whether it's just for bacteria, for prokaryotic cells or, or eukaryotic cells, and archaea generally, although there's modifications that happen with the archaea that we'll get into later in the course, and I'll mention a few of them now, but we're mostly focused on uh, the bacterial cell membrane. It's going to be composed of certain components. The primary component is phospholipid. So you should be familiar with the structure of a phospholipid. Uh, the phospholipid has a three carbon molecule. It's a glycerol, which has oxygens attached to it. And then there's generally hydrogens attached to those, but now they're going to be involved in the formation of bonds. So what you're going to end up uh, having are two fatty acids. And so this is going to be just a series of carbons. Carbon, 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 carbon. Just long chains. So long. And why am I just not giving you a number? It's because they're variable in number. Uh, of how long they are. So different phospholipids have different, sorry, different fatty acids have different characteristics based on um, the number of carbons that they have. They, um, they are fatty acids because they end in a carboxyl group and that's kind of where the bond takes place between the, the glycerol. And there's two of those. So there's two fatty acids here. Then the glycerol molecule here, there's one of those. And then attached to the glycerol, it's one thing people often forget. Now it's called a phospholipid, right? So you gotta have a phosphate functional group. I'm not gonna draw the whole thing. It's a PO4 negative two. It's actually uh, surrounded by four oxygens here. Um, but we're just gonna draw a circle like this to represent the phosphorus with the four oxygens. Uh, and then there's still something more. So that's a phosphate. And there's still more to it. There's something else, right? So attached to that, attached to the phosphate group is some polar molecule. And I'm not gonna be more specific than that because that's another thing that separates the difference between the different phospholipids are the different polar molecules. Uh, like phosphatidyl inositol has a polar molecule inositol uh, attached to the phosphate group, which is attached to the glycerol, which is attached to two fatty acids, and they could be different lengths. In addition to being different lengths, generally you have you know single bonds like I'm drawing here between the carbons, but sometimes there can be double bonds, which makes them unsaturated, uh, and then you lose some of the hydrogen. So it's unsaturated with hydrogen, or think of it the other way, when we call it saturated, it's saturated with hydrogen. So essentially attached to each of these carbons would be hydrogens, you know, two hydrogens, hydrogens, and, and so forth. So it's hyd hydrogen and carbon. It's all very non-polar. 
means it doesn't like water. Now, what we're drawing here and how it's referenced is that this part here is the polar head, okay, and that's kind of the polar molecule, the phosphate, the glycerol, and kind of right into the beginning here where we have polar bonds. So this is going to be all polar and like water, interact with water, interact with charged molecules, polar molecules, and so forth. And then we have the two squiggles we have here representing the tails. They represent the two fatty acid tails that are nonpolar. So this molecule, the phospholipid here, uh, is an amphi Amphipathic molecule. Like an amphibian, frog, to salamander, um, requires water at a stage in their life, typically as a terrestrial at another stage in their life. Maybe they have gills and then they have lungs. Water, no water, or outside of water. Um, amphibious, so that it has a part that likes water, a part that doesn't like water. Generally, if you look at the overall size of them, they tend to be almost equal to be one to one another. So it's a molecule that isn't polar or nonpolar, it's both or an equal in, in each way. And that's what allows us to structure a membrane. <clears throat> because what happens is when put, in, if you just take individual phospholipids, put them into an environment with water and mix it up, the tails, these parts here are gonna hate water, try to get away from water. And so one thing they can do is form little balls like this. We have the polar heads on the outside. And the nonpolar fatty acid tails on the inside, imagine this is a three dimensional sphere. Uh, and then there's water outside here, you know, interacting with the polar heads, but no water inside. That's one possibility. The second possibility is where we have a double structure form. So the tails attract, well, they don't really attract other tails, but it's just that the, the heads attract water and the tails push away from water, the tails can interact with other tails, sort of more by default. It's not really an attraction. Um, it's called a nonpolar interaction because nonpolar molecules in the presence of polar molecules will just stay away from them. They don't really interact and they'll push away from each other. Or not really push, but the polar ones pulling other polar things um, to it and it's not interacting or essentially ignoring the nonpolar things. Um, so the nonpolar things get kind of stuck together. They're not really forming bonds, but they don't want to move into the polar environment. So it does have a stabilizing effect. And now we have kind of a double layer where we have phospholipid on the outside then flipped in the opposite orientation, phospholipids on the inside. And now what we can do is we can actually have water. It's really tiny, you probably can't read that, but there's water on the inside, there's water on the outside. So we can start to form a structure that's like a cell. So this is technically called a micelle, a natural forming structure with phospholipids. And this is called a liposome. It's a natural forming structure. You could form either of these. If you just pour some phospholipids into a container of water and shake it up, these would just form spontaneously on their own. All right. And this is the basics, basis for the structure of our cell membranes in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Now, in our cells, eukaryotic cells, and plants, right, and fungi, right, and proteists, and these other organisms, between the tails of the phospholipids are cholesterol molecules. That's, we, we all have that. All these other organisms have that as well. And it affects the fluidity of the membrane. It's a membrane property. But bacteria do not have that. Okay, So there's no cholesterol. No cholesterol here, just the phospholipids. What else do we have? Well, other things that are very important and similar to what we have in our cells. So we have um, proteins, people refer to them as integral versus peripheral. But when we talk about 
and you read about integral proteins and I talk about proteins, I'm mostly going to be talking about ones that I refer to as transmembrane proteins. And you'll, I'll explain this in a second. So what is a peripheral protein? Actually, I'll go to that one first. A peripheral protein is a protein attached to the membrane, and it could be attached to either side. So it's usually attached, you know, here to the membrane, like this. This would be a protein, and it's peripheral. And then it's only attached to one side, and it can typically be cut or removed from the membrane um, and just be completely isolated on its own without disturbing or destroying the membrane itself. It's called a peripheral one. So just on, on one side. Now more of the definition of an integral protein is a protein that's stuck in the membrane in a way that you'd have to actually destroy the membrane to get the protein out. So if you wanted to analyze it, you have to break it up, which means it's, it's stuck deeper essentially in the membrane. Most all the integral proteins that we are going to be discussing are ones re I refer to as transmembrane. That's because for those, there's a part of the protein on one side of the membrane, and then the protein continues all the way through the phospholipid bilayer, and there's a piece of the protein on the other side of the membrane. So this is trans across membrane. So all transmembrane proteins are technically integral proteins because you'd have to destroy the membrane to get it out because it's stuck all the way in it. Not all integral proteins are transmembrane. So you can have a protein that's kind of sort of more peripheral. So it's on one side, but it's kind of embedded deeper, but it doesn't go through all the way to the other side. Okay, so it's just associated with one side of the membrane. It doesn't go all the way through the membrane um, but it can't be just cut off like a peripheral protein is just cut off and removed from the membrane because these some peripheral proteins are attached to other proteins like this. They aren't even attached to the phospholipids. So these two here, this would be a peripheral. This would be an integral. And the peripherals attached to the integral protein. You see that? So we can remove that peripheral protein um, by cutting it away but we can't remove the uh, integral protein. All right, so those are a lot of the, the main components. I'm going to erase some of this um, and keep going for another uh, little bit here just so I can add a few more things into this, okay? I'm going to erase these guys over here. Hopefully you got that structure. You can also refer back to your um, phospholipid structure. Now, with bacteria, so... And this is going to be the same for our eukaryotic cells as well. We're going to have these same sorts of things. Um, the phospholipids, the peripheral proteins, the transmembrane proteins. And now on the outside, keep this in mind, on the, this is the cytoplasmic side. The other one is the one that we'd call the extracellular side. So on the extracellular side, sticking off of it, typically we can have, I'm going to talk about carbohydrates, okay? You can have carbo carbohydrates in the cell. We have carbohydrates inside our cytoplasm. Bacteria have carbohydrates inside their cytoplasm, but they're not attached to the membrane itself. Okay. But on the outside, we can have carbohydrate chains. Actually, let me use uh, green because I haven't used green yet, and that'll designate it as something uh, different, different kind of molecule. Here we go. So these are now the carbohydrates. So a carbohydrate chain. It can be attached to a lipid. So if it's a sugar attached to the lipid here, attached to a phospholipid, we call it a glycolipid. If it's a sugar and it's attached to a protein like this, a lot of times they branch like that. It's called a glyco 
protein. So we have glycoproteins and glycolipids, but they're only on the outside. So in bacterial cells, this can form the structure of a uh, glycocalyx, but it's a little bit different here. It's not the same exact ones here. These are ones attached to the membrane itself. The glycocalyx is going to be something that's outside the cell wall. So say, whoa, whoa, whoa. so what are we talking about here? Now, last thing I'm going to talk about in this particular uh, lecture here, and that's the basic structure of the cell membrane that you need to know just for the bacterial cell. So phospholipids, what is the structure of a phospholipid? Membrane proteins, integral proteins, they, we have the transmembrane, and then we have the peripheral proteins, and they can be on either side of the membrane. And then there's carbohydrates only on the outside, uh, glycoproteins, glycolipids. Now, bacteria are going to have a cell wall. Different types of cell walls and different types of bacteria, but, uh, gram positive and gram negative. So generally, we're going to have that layer. We'll go into all the details in the lectures on cell wall. The cell walls produced, the chemicals are produced inside the cell, and then they have to be transported from the cytoplasm through transport molecules, often things like transmembrane proteins, out of the cell, and then they'll make or be assembled into the, the cell wall itself. There is going to be a space, though, here. Called the periplasm. So typically, and this is why I was kind of emphasizing that extracellular and I'll, with and uh, trying to get you thinking about it, because often there's a space outside the cell membrane, but then there's a cell wall, and then there's extracellular. Now, why am I trying to really overemphasize that? And that's because this space here, even though it's not the cytoplasmic space, this space outside the membrane, this periplasm space, can have enzymes in it, there can be chemical reactions taking place. There could be a whole number of other things happening. So it's like a second space um, that bacterial cells have that people often don't know about, don't think about, and don't realize. It's typically much larger uh, in gram-negative bacteria than in gram-positive bacteria. But both gram-positive and gram-negative have this periplasmic space, a space outside the cell membrane. And that's where other things can happen and, and be stored. And we'll get into that as we talk about metabolism and structure and other sorts of things. So this is your kind of intro um, to bacterial cell membrane structure. Um, you should also be familiar with diffusion and osmosis and transport, active transport, passive transport. So simple diffusion, which is diffusion you know, directly across the phospholipids. Um, facilitated diffusion, which is diffusion through transport proteins active transport, which is where one of these proteins can change shape. It's much bigger and more complicated and it actually acts like a little pump that pushes things from one side to the other. All those things, as they happen in uh, eukaryotic cells, very similar, pretty much the same as in prokaryotic cells. There are unique differences uh, in different, very specific ways with specific organisms, but the overall process that things that govern them are, are all going to be the same in concept. So study those as well to get an idea of what's going on um, with these organisms and their spaces.